After a 15-month break, Iran and the world's major powers engage in a new round of nuclear talks. The U.S. calls it a positive first step and the Europeans describe it as constructive and promising. But what's different this time and will a compromise be reached? You're watching Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Divya Gopal and it's good to have you here. So on Saturday, six world powers and Iran launched a new round of negotiations in Istanbul. They were aiming to resolve a dispute over Tehran's nuclear program that threatens to spark a war in the Middle East. Saturday's meeting between Iran and the six major players was the first in 15 months. The gathering is widely seen as a chance for the countries involved to halt a downward diplomatic spiral and to seek ways out of a deadlock. Further discussions are planned next month in the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. Now, they hope to persuade Iran to reduce its enrichment of uranium and fully open up its nuclear facilities to inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Iran says it is entitled to enrich uranium up to 20 percent under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It also insists that its nuclear program is completely peaceful. Well, speaking at the end of the talks, the European Union's foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, gave a positive impression of the first session. Well, I think we've been clear in the statement of the following things. First of all, that the non-proliferation treaty is a key basis upon which we will work. Secondly, that we are looking for Iran to fulfill all its international obligations. Thirdly, that we see a step-by-step -step process and that we've agreed that reciprocity will be a part of that. Now, for a number of years, talks on Iran's nuclear program made no progress due to preconditions and rigid positions on both sides. And this is what they looked like. In October 2009, Iran met representatives from the six world powers in Geneva, where a plan was approved to send 75 percent of its low enriched uranium to Russia and France. Now, in May 2010, Iran, Brazil and Turkey signed a nuclear fuel swap deal. However, this was not implemented due to a lack of U.S., French and Russian involvement. Talks started again in December 2010 in Geneva between Iranian nuclear negotiator Saeed Jalili and EU foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton. Now, the discussions were on behalf of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council as well as Germany. In January 2011, talks with the six world powers in Istanbul ended in failure. And last month, they agreed to resume talks with Iran. So, can a compromise with Iran be reached? Well, to help us answer this question, we are joined by our guests. In Tehran, Sadek Zabakalam, a professor of political science at Tehran University. Over in Moscow, Sergei Alexandrovich Markov. He is the vice president of Blethanov, the Russian University of Economics, and a Russian political analyst. And from Stanford, California, Arash Aramesh, national security and Middle East analyst at Stanford University Law School. A very warm welcome to all three of you. Now, I'm going to put my first question to Sadek Zabakalam. I want to talk about why there's such an air of optimism over these talks, given that there has been no outcome yet. Well, um, I think um, the, the optimism and enthusiasm, which this time... Uh, uh, has actually raised uh, at the end of the first round of talk uh, uh, yesterday uh, in, in Istanbul is because I think we are observing for the first time the beginning of uh, confidence uh, building up steps uh, between Iran and uh, Western power really. Uh, uh, and I think that's very significant because uh, for the first time, the West uh, has used a language which, which Iran has always desired to be addressed by that language. And, 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 and also the, the West appears to be feeling more confidence that Iran is genuine, Iran is not bluffing, Iran is not trying to buy time, and the Iranians are serious in resolving uh, the outstanding issues. Sergei Alexandrovich Markov, now I want to put a question to you. Does Russia feel that Iran is serious about ending this standoff? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, we think uh, all uh, sides are serious. 
uh, but in Iran we can see that uh, one poli some politicians serious about uh, um, developing of uh, nuclear programs and probably some of them uh, has uh, uh, military future and uh, another politician serious about reaching uh, compromise uh, same time uh, United States quite serious uh, not to have a sword uh, war during uh, uh, last years because uh, this new war with Iran uh, can undermine very much uh, uh, possibility of, of Barack uh, Obama to be re-elected. And same time, uh, European <coughs> Union also uh, not so happy about the war. But I s we think that Israel is quite uh, serious also. Uh, I think this optimism of different sides uh, remember me the optimism of uh, those who seek uh, by cancer a uh, few uh, weeks uh, before uh, to die. And uh, usually it's, uh, it's happened. And uh, I think that all these sides want to, uh, to avoid uh, the war. But Israel is uh, very interesting about the war, first of all, uh, to crash uh, Iran uh, nuclear uh, objects uh, because uh, security issues and also Israel uh, don't, don't want very much to uh, Barack Obama to be re-elected and such kind of uh, airstrikes uh, and some war in the Middle East uh, mm -hmm. can stop Barack Obama to re-elect and Israeli leaders uh, hate him. That's why uh, I predicted that uh, Israel cannot bomb uh, before uh, presidential elections in Egypt happen because okay. if so um, uh, radical Islamists can win and sometimes they will do it before starting of the presidential campaign in the United States. All it's, right. It means something about on July. Um, I want to pick up on the Israel factor there a little later, but I also want to pick up on the factor that you were talking about, about what's at stake here. Now, Barack Obama has very clearly said that, the, according to the U.S. media, and this is the, they're quoting him, that the Obama administration will make two specific demands in Iran, the closure of its heavily fortified underground uranium enrichment facility at Fordo and the export of Iran's stockpile of medium-enriched uranium. Now, this is a question for Arash Aramesh, and I want to ask you why Iran would agree to these things, given that they invested billions of dollars, and this, this whole enrichment program is a source of national pride. What else can they do? Uh, Backbreaking economic sanctions, international coalition, a campaign uh, put together and organized by... President Obama and his very brilliant Secretary, Secretary of State has brought the uh, Iranian government to its knees. When I hear that, oh, uh, the Iranian government now is being talked to the way they want to be talked to, or I heard a uh, member of parliament the other day say that uh, at the Istanbul talks, the West was no longer making threats. You know why they're not making threats? Because they've actually made all these threats come true. The short of uh, military strikes, Iran is under tremendous backbreaking. Uh, choking, suffocating sanctions by the uh, Western world and by not just the Western world, but the international community. And they have, they have to come back to the table. They have to. Look at what's happening in Iran. Look at what's happening to the economy. Uh, and again, as uh, uh, the man on top of the pyramid of decision-making power in, in Iran has realized, he has to make some concessions. I want to address a couple of things, though. Uh, one of your guests in Moscow who mentioned that Israel doesn't want to see the president being reelected, that's just ludicrous. I mean, this is just uh, conspiracy theory uh, thinking right here. Uh, the U.S. and Israel have great ties, and I'm sure there are some uh, differences between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, but the fact to think that one country is trying to attack another country to prevent an American president from being reelected is just one of those ludicrous ideas, and I don't know how else to put it. Uh, that I just had to address it right now. Sergei Alexandrovich Markov, I just want you to respond to that. Uh allegation there from Mr. Aramesh. Yeah, of course, uh, you can say that uh, it's a conspiracy, that it uh, wouldn't happen, but uh, it uh, uh, can happen because Israel um, not only uh, hate Barack Obama and want uh, uh, Republican candidates uh, to be elected, but also Israel doesn't trust the United States and uh, also to European Union. If you uh, can chance to read Israeli uh, media, you can see uh, thousands of articles exactly about this, that Israel 
can uh, rely only on own military capacities, but not on the promises of um, Washington and uh, uh, European uh, politicians. Uh, that's why I think uh, Israel will uh, be ready to make the decision itself. If Israel will make decision about military strike against Iran, uh, of course, uh, uh, public opinion in the United States will be uh, mostly uh, to support Israel, even if it will be uh, uh, bloody and some uh, problematic uh, uh, strike. Uh, anyway, uh, United States is a lie of, of Israel. Not uh, only Washington politicians are lies, but uh, public opinion in the United States very, uh, very uh, strongly support Israel in different contexts of uh, Israel with uh, his uh, uh, rivals. Okay, so very different viewpoints there on what role Israel plays and why they play that certain role. But the one thing that is clear and what most people would agree on is that sanctions have had some kind of an impact. How much of an impact we'll be discussing, but I want to first go back to our viewers and uh, re retract what these sanctions were and how much has been put on Iran. Now, over the last year, Western countries have intensified pressure on Iran with a whole range of sanctions. These are primarily designed to target the country's energy sector and isolate it from the international community. So in January, the European Union agreed to an oil embargo on Iran and a freeze on Iran's central bank assets. Then in March, the EU instructed the Brussels-based SWIFT financial messaging network to disconnect 25 Iranian banks. Now, the United States went further with an almost total economic embargo on Iran. Then in February, they also imposed a freeze on Iranian assets. Now, this also put more pressure on other countries to intensify their sanctions. So although Western leaders argue that sanctions are specifically targeted at the government, they're also hitting the ordinary Iranians hard. Staggering inflation has led to the price of food staples like meat and milk to skyrocket by as much as 50 percent. The sharp drop in the value of Iran's currency has also spiked the price of imported goods. And as intended, the sanctions are also having an effect on the country's oil sector. Last month, exports dropped by 300,000 barrels a day and production fell to a 10-year low. Analysts are now predicting that by the summer, Tehran's oil exports could fall by another 700,000 barrels a day. So that's just oil. And Mr. Zabakalam, I want to take this question to you. How much are the Iranians spooked by these sanctions and how much have these sanctions pushed them towards that negotiating table? I don't think anyone in Iran can, in all fairness and sincerity, deny or, or even to underestimate the um, detrimental san uh, effects of uh, sanctions on uh, the Iranian uh, economy. I mean, I I'm not trying to hide that, that the sanctions have indeed uh, uh, hurt the um, um, Iranian people and um, the Islamic regime. But I think uh, what has uh, made uh, the Iranian uh, to look for compromise and to go towards confidence uh, building um, steps uh, are not particularly uh, because of the sanctions. You see, the core of the problem, the core of the dispute between Iran and the Western power over its nu nuclear uh, program is really the enrichment. Now, if Iran can build enough confidence for the West so that the Western powers, including Israel, know what Iran is up to, know exactly what Iran is doing. I don't think all this talk about um, attacking Iran, whether Israel would do it, or whether the United States would do it, or whether they do it jointly. I think when they pretty certain that Iran is doing uh, what we know, uh, I don't think uh, there would be any need for, uh, for using uh, threatening language uh, towards uh, Iran. Unfortunately, as up to now, the West has always maintained that. I'm not so sure what Iran is up to. But if we can reach uh, some, some kind of understanding between Iran and the West, so that the West is quite aware of what is happening in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, then, 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 then we, can, we can see that the problems are beginning to, to resolve. 
Mr. Aramesh, what's your viewpoint on sanctions? They've, they've thrown some pretty hefty sanctions on Iran, and, and Iran is certainly tightening its belt. Do you think that this had something to do with them walking towards the table? President Obama reached out to the Iranian leadership two years ago, three years ago, as a matter of fact. And when his uh, genuine offer uh, for talks uh, were rejected by the Iranian leadership, he had no other option uh, short of going to war but to impose sanctions. He built this beautiful coalition of many, many countries to uh, impose sanctions on Iran, and they have worked. Uh, unfortunately, sanctions, when they work, they also put a heavy burden on the local population. A lot of good people in Iran, great people in Iran, and they're actually suffering because of these sanctions. Um, I just learned that some people who want to take the uh, foreign English TOEFL language test in Iran can no longer do that because ESL is no longer offering those tests because of the sanctions. So a lot of good people are hurting. But again, you have two options. A, uh, go to war, which is going to be a terrible, terrible option to choose. And the other one is to uh, impose sanctions, to try to bring the party, the uh, non-negotiating party, back to the negotiating table. And that's what they had to do. Uh, they've come back, which is a great thing, and I think Dr. Zibak Kalam is right when he says that confidence has to be built. There's a lot of confidence that needs to be built. And um, the best way to do that is for the Iranians to open up the sites, to allow inspectors in without preconditions, to allow inspections, um, to allow mandatory and random inspections. That would be a great thing to do. And again, it's not just the West trying to be harsh and threatening or, you know, what you, what you call it. It's just that there, there has been years and years and years of mistrust and distrust between the uh, two sides. And uh, it's about time to prevent another uh, war in the region and a disaster politically, economically and militarily in the uh, Mideast uh, to try to uh, build some good trust and good faith. Building trust and faith. Mr. Markov, now... Barack Obama has described this as the last chance of talks. He said it's the last chance for diplomacy to work. As from the Russian viewpoint, what does that mean to you? What's the alternative? Well, yeah, of course, I'm re representing my own point of view. Uh, uh, but I think that, uh, of course, the Western countries threaten to Iran uh, trying to uh, stop nuclear program. And at uh, the same time, uh, a lot of people from uh, in Moscow believe that we should uh, make pressure on Iran to stop military nucle nuclear program because it's very much not interesting about this. Uh, uh, but uh, also we shouldn't threaten to Iran by regime change and uh, military intervention. Uh, because look at the from a uh, Tehran point of view, like, uh, let's compare uh, uh, Iraq uh, and Libya on one hand and Northern Korea on another hand. Uh, we know that Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi stopped development of their nuclear programs. And what was the result? Military intervention and those uh, leaders have been killed by uh, their uh, enemies. And the international forces allow this to do. But on another hand, Northern Korea created a nuclear bomb and uh, nobody uh, uh, made uh, aggression, intervention against it. Even uh, on contrary, uh, uh, international com uh, community giving some agricultural support, uh, some uh, food support uh, to the Northern Korea. What uh, the this conclusion uh, uh, people uh, in Iran uh, can make? Of course, uh, we should uh, make some our military capacities and not uh, uh, to allow to attack us. And that's why we believe that uh, threaten by regime change it's uh, one of the key reasons for development of uh, military nuclear programs in Iran if it uh, happens. Okay, so would you say, Mr. Zabakalam, that it is important for Iran to maintain some nuclear program in order to be safe or to not be invaded or occupied? Well, I, I quite agree with uh, our um, Russian um, colleague in, in, in Moscow. Uh, there are some Iranian analysts, there are some Iranian um, officials within the Revolutionary Guard, within the uh, armed forces, uh, radical, call them radical, call them what you like, that uh, they maintain, that they believe that uh, the only way that, that we can prevent uh, 
uh, an Afghanistan scenario for our country, an Iraq scenario for our country, a Libyan scenario for our country, <clears throat> is actually uh, to build enough uh, military power uh, so that no one dare uh, to think of uh, attacking uh, Iran. That's, uh, that's, of course, very unfortunate because uh, because we have to we, we have to pay a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, of our national interest for uh, maintaining um, a huge uh, military expenditure. And uh, if the West uh, could actually change their attitude and stop saying that we are going to, to go for regime change, a military option is on the table. If they um, the, the, the respond to Iranian confidence building measure. And if they say that they are not after uh, invading Iran, they are not after regime change, uh, I think the hardliners in Iran uh, will not uh, take the, will not have the upper hand. Okay, I want to put the same question to Mr. Aramesh. How important is it for Iran to maintain its nuclear program in order to make sure that they are protected to a certain extent? Well, the, the Iranian uh, government has done a very good job tying this nuclear program to national identity and national pride. The Iranian people, with their long history and long and very old civilization, are a proud people, and they have uh, the government has done a good job comparing this to the oil nationalization movement of 1951, and also to uh, a lot of Persian and Iranian pride. Quick point: I want to address a couple of points that Mr. Markov in Moscow uh, mentioned. Uh, first of all, yes, you have the Iraq. Uh, scenario and you also have the North Korea scenario. Look at what's happened in North Korea. A million children dead, famine, uh, terrible, terrible hunger, terrible uh, humanitarian disaster in North Korea. Yes, they have a nuclear weapon. Well, they have a couple of nuclear warheads or a few. Uh, yes, uh, possibly there will be no threat of foreign invasion. But look at what's happening, at what cost. Uh, again, the, the, I think the Russian government for the past 20 years has used the uh, Iranian nuclear program as a cash register. Every time they're short on funds, they just ring the cash, cash register, and then the register produces cash. It took them, what, 26, 27 years to uh, build the uh, Boucher facility that usually takes about six to eight years. Every time they raise the price, at the, tam at the same time, using Boucher nuclear facility as a leverage against the Americans in the West, they tried to get points from the, uh, from the Israelis, from the Westerners, and from the Americans. So I, I, I don't think the, uh, the uh, Putin's Russia and, uh, is, is, is exactly being an honest broker or an, an honest uh, party in this in in, the, in this uh, in this um, conflict uh, and in, in this issue uh, but we got to keep in mind yes uh, there was an invasion of Iraq and it was a bloody invasion although Iraq is doing a lot better today than it was a few years back and look at North Korea I mean is that uh, I'm not in any way pro uh, proposing or or supporting a military conflict or an invasion far from it don't get me wrong not at all and I tend to agree with Dr. Zeba Kellam here to, uh, to some extent but I just want to make sure that people uh, are very clear about North Korea it is no rosy picture in North Korea people are dying and starving and the country is the most isolated country on the face of the earth thanks to its nuclear program. So, Mr. Markov, is Russia really interested in getting this process rolling? Do they want an end to Iran's nuclear program? Of course, uh, Russia very much not interested about Iranian nu nuclear military program uh, because also believes that it will lead to the domino uh, scenario. And Saudi Arabia probably will have m uh, nuclear bomb uh, and uh, probably Egypt also will have military bomb. And with such combination of uh, military powers, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, e Egypt and Israel, uh, we can very easily come to the military contact and total destroying this uh, region. Which is, uh, which is very important for the global economy because it's most of the oil, as we know, produced in those areas. And uh, at the same time, we differ very much uh, uh, peaceful uh, uh, nuclear programs which we are supporting and uh, military nuclear program. And we think that uh, international community also uh, should uh, uh, make very uh, clear distinction between this and making cooperation with the Iranian regime, not uh, to threaten by regime change. Gentlemen, there's just so much to discuss. You've all brought up some great points that deserve so much more time. Unfortunately, time is something we don't have. The show is nearly over. And I'd like to thank our guests in Tehran, Sadek Zibakalam, 
in Moscow, Sergei Alexandrovich Markov. And from Stanford, California, Arash Aramesh, thank you very much. And also, of course, to our viewers, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. And if you want to send us your feedback, you can just email us your thoughts at insidestory at aljazeera.net. It's been good to have you with us. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye for now.